right. I'm rolling. Go for it. Okay, this is um, Lessons of the 60s. We're interviewing Cliff Smith today. Uh, we're at the Institute, Institute for Policy Studies, and the date today is May 27th, 19, uh, May 27th, 2016. Uh, Peter Roof is our cameraman, and the interviewer is myself, Ann Gallagher. Uh, Cliff Smith uh, is a native Arlington, Arlingtonian uh, from Virginia who um, joined the State Department in 1961 and through the next few years became a very ardent anti-war activist. So we're going to start with that, uh, Cliff. Uh, in 1960, you were a pretty patri patriotic American, right? And, oh, I always have been. I still am. That's why I wear this hat. Okay. Um, I feel that uh, I uh, entered the civil rights movement in 1960 and later the anti-war movement and later became a radical hippie and later became a communist, all for the same reasons, because it was to expand democracy and expand our rights, uh, rights of all human beings and so on, and I still feel that intensely to this day. I call myself today a Democrat with a small d. And I feel that democracy is the most radical philosophy ever created by human beings, more so than communism or socialism or whatever, because to really accept people as equal and to say that we should have equal rights against all oppression is obviously against all the oppressive that, uh, fa factors of our civilization. That patriotism and idealism was one of the reasons probably that you went into the State Department, right? You it was the main reason because I really accepted the beliefs of America, all people created equal and democracy, and I felt that in the State Department that maybe I could help uh, spread these ideas in other parts of the world. In those years, 60, 61, were also the years when Kennedy came into office and inspired young people yes. to changed the world, founded the Peace Corps, and so it was definitely part of that reality. Correct for you? Yeah, well, actually, it's kind of weird because uh, in 1960, I worked as a Capitol cop. It was a summer job, and I was guarding the main door to the Senate. So I got to see Kennedy and Nixon. This was during, the, obviously, the 60 campaign every day, and also got aware of LBJ. And actually, in 1960, I was for LBJ for president because I felt, given his command of Congress, that he could actually pass more and better legislation than Kennedy could. And, of course, Kennedy was not a really very good senator. And even as president, he did not have that power. I think in terms of his character, his optimism and so on, spread around the world and in the United States. In fact, I would argue a lot of the optimism of the 60s occurred because of the optimism that Kennedy gave us. Maybe not in terms of actual deeds, but in terms of his words and so on. It was a spirit. It I agree. Spirit I agree. Yes, yes. Well, so um, let's start with around 1960, when you were still here, and um, talk a little about what it was like to be in the State Department. What were your postings? What, what, what kind of a guy were you right, 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 in those right, early right. years? Let me give a, a tiny bit of background. I'm originally from Alaska. Uh, my grandfather went up in the Klondike Gold Rush, but in 19, but my, my dad was a mining engineer. He had a gold mine, a tin mine there. They fell through, so he came here to join the Atomic Energy Commission, and he ended up working out in western Colorado uh, with the uranium mines of the Four Corners area, and he retired from that. You know, we moved to Arlington because he joined the Atomic Energy Commission, so I went to junior and senior high school in Arlington, Virginia, and after that I went to... Uh, to uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania. It was at University of Pennsylvania. I was in my first demonstration in 1960, uh, picketing Woolworths in Philadelphia in support of the Greensboro sit-in students down in North Carolina. Right. And, um, and I, I entered State Department immediately after getting my bachelor degree, um, and uh, for the you know, uh, idealistic reasons, and perhaps naive reasons, but I have no regrets about that when I entered State. What did you get a master's degree in? Oh, I got only a bachelor's degree, and I went immediately into, into state after getting my bachelor's oh, degrees at University of Pennsylvania. Okay, so, so tell us about the first few years of being a Foreign Service officer. Where did you go? What was okay, my, my, uh, I got uh, nine or ten months of training uh, here in, in uh, Spanish training and just diplomatic training here in D.C. for about a year in 1962. And then in the uh, end of 62, we traveled by train to uh, El Paso, Texas. My first post was in the American consulate in Juarez, Mexico. Now, I knew nothing about Mexico, very little, and I knew nothing about the whole Chicano-North American relationship. And of course, all of a sudden, it's all uh, absolutely clear before my eyes. In fact, I would argue that there's no two countries in the world as different from one another, with which have a huge border as Mexico and the U.S. It's like going from one planet to another, even right on the border. 
So how long were you in Mexico? I was there for two years, and uh, basically it was visas. Uh, every morning before the consulate opened, we had probably a thousand people standing outside the consulate every morning. And it was mostly campesinos, peasants, who had worked as braceros in the United States under temporary programs, and they wanted to come to the U.S. permanently. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was uh, usually families that were getting visas and so on. And, uh, and so, uh, I mean, I, would, I personally issued one day a hundred uh, uh, residence visas to people. Um, we rejected a lot of people uh, and so on, but uh, that was, the, and also I did protection for a while. We had 200 Americans a week arrested for drunkenness in Juarez, a city dedicated to getting them drunk. And uh, the jail had 16 cells for 800 prisoners. It was a nightmare. Was that a was Mexico a politicizing thing for you, or did you, were you still kind of... I was a liberal. <laughs> in other words, I'd been in the civil rights movement. My mother had worked with the NACP in the 50s in Arlington, in great Arlington schools. She raises that everybody was equal. I'm proud to be my mother's son, because even though she was from a very, very racist Texas around World War I when she was a kid, um, somehow she came to the belief that everybody was equal. And I think it came about because when she was young, she told me she would check out all the books in the library about famous women. And I think she came to the idea that women are equal to men. In fact, actually, she believed women are superior to men. And I think then she thought, well, if women are equal, everybody's equal. And so that's how she raised this. And even though my father is very racist, very sexist, yeah. he believed in eugenics, but he was away at his minds a lot. So we were basically raised by my mother. Well, let's get you, uh, now you, you were in Mexico, and then you went to Iran, correct? Yes, that's right. What was it like being a foreign service officer in Iran, and when did you start? Well, a, a, aside from a little bit of Canada and a little bit of Mexico, I'd never been outside the United States. So, of course, this was gigantic for me. We took a ship across the ocean. We got a few hours in the Madeira Islands, a few hours in Casablanca. Then we go in Algeciras, Spain. We take the train to Madrid, to Paris, to Vienna, uh, or Orient Express, believe it or not, mm -hmm. then by flight to, uh, to Tehran. So it was an eye-opening experience for me. And Iran is just a fabulous country. After the United States to this day, Iran is my favorite country in the world. I just, what did you love about Iran? Well, of course, there's the unbelievable history. I mean, going back to, uh, you know, to Cyrus the Great and Darius and Xerxes and this incredible uh, poetry and their miniatures. And, uh, uh, and of course, just as French was sort of the cultural language of, uh, of Europe, uh, Persian was the cultural language of India, Afghanistan, uh, that whole part of the world. And, and it's, to some degree, there's some of that uh, hanging on to this day. But anyway, we just loved it. And, and there was a gentleness to the society. You would see men walking down the street holding a rose in their hands. You'd see men walking down the street holding hands with one another. And it's a softness that you would not see here in the United States. Didn't you um, do your anti-war petition during your posting in Iran? The second posting in Iran, I was there twice. I, I was in Iran, in Tehran, then we came to the United States for two years, the State Department, then I went back to Iran as an exile post, frankly. Uh, we loved going back to Iran, but it was obvious they were kicking me out of state at that time. So uh, the first time in Iran, I was just getting into Iran. We did a lot of travel there, did a lot of reading, archaeological stuff, uh, historical stuff. And of course, at that time, my belief about Iranian government was still what I'd learned in 1953 from the newspapers in which it was an internal revolt that had uh, overthrown Mossadegh, the democratically elected uh, president, and put the Shah into power. It wasn't until after I left state that I learned that it was the U.S. government with CIA that had overthrown Mossadegh. In other words, I'm in the State Department, I'm in Tehran, I have a top secret clearance, and we were given no knowledge of what we had done in 53 only, only 10 years before. So I was still naive about Iran. And since I had top secret clearance, I would not read outside sources because I thought, well, I'm inside. I know all this stuff, right? And I realized now that the New York Times has better access to top people at state than I did being inside state. In a sense, the secrets, like a, like a Masonic order, are only revealed to you in state as you rise up in, 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 uh, in promotion. You were just expected to do your job. With that's your right, person. that's right. And I did consular work there, but I also did economic work, and I did a little political work, and so on, so on. But uh, we had a wonderful time in Iran. So what's your first open rebellion? Uh, in, in the State Department, it was, uh, it was after I returned uh, in 67 to so 69, I was here in Washington, D.C. My first job was at a, a Secretary of State's office in which it's called the uh, Ops Center, the Operations Center, Crisis Center. Uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, John Kennedy learned the State Department only operated from 8 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon. All officers. In other words, if something happened in the middle of the night, there was nobody at State. <laughs> 
So we instituted this operations center, which ran 24-7, which is what I got into. But can you imagine having crises around the world, <laughs> different time zones in which we paid no attention to at State Department? But anyway, so I worked at operations center, and my job was to take a summary of all world events. We got all the cables, all the reports from every consulate and embassy in the world. And every twice a day, we'd put this together into a three by five page summary. And I was writing this, and it was for the Secretary of State and for the President LBJ, uh, President Johnson. And I, was, I did this for eight months and so on. So uh, here I was writing. At the same time, I became radicalized because in, in, April, uh, in April 15th, 1967, I did my first anti-war march up in New York City. And I went up there, at my time off from my job, went up there in my suit, I believe, and I'm alone. I don't know anybody in D.C. against the war. I don't know anybody near. I don't know. I'm, I'm alone, and I'm terrified. They're going to find out I'm in the State Department. <laughs> They're going to condemn me. And I got to the march, and the feeling, I mean, this is like hundreds of thousands of people, the feeling of love. I mean, I'm alone, but just it was a feeling of positiveness and love and friendliness that, that I'd never felt in my life before that march. And then in the fall, I became a marshal for the Pentagon March in October 67. 67. And, uh, and that's when I began to get to know other people. And, uh, and I went to the house at 1854 uh, Wyoming Avenue for training in terms of being a marshal and so on. And so that was a, a great day was the Pentagon and you're, March. And you're attending all these anti-war activities and getting involved in them while you're still a state That's department right, officer. that's right. In fact, after the Pentagon March, I come back to the office. And the same office that I was in, uh, which is just a door away from Rusk's, from Secretary of State Rusk's office, where all, where all the military advisors to Rusk also had their offices. So the day after the march, this Air Force officer comes up to me and he says, oh, he saw my flushed face. And he said, oh, were you playing tennis yesterday? And I said, no, I was at the march. And he said, oh, did they call up your unit? And I said, no. I said, I was at the march. He freaked out. He ran all over the office. I mean, as far as he was concerned, the Viet Cong was in his office. The communist was in his office. The subversive was there. And uh, the next day, uh, my bosses talked to me and I argued with him. I said, listen, I feel that I, as an American citizen in the United States, that I have my constitutional rights under the First Amendment. I said, I did not take time off from work. I've done nothing uh, against State Department policy while I'm on the job. I said, but I disagree with the war and I feel as a private citizen that I could march to the Pentagon. They said that they accepted that argument and said they were going to put nothing in my file, but I have no idea if they did or not. Tell me about the petition now. Okay, then I got to a connect. Uh, I'm not sure how she heard about me, but uh, Madeline Gold, who is at Federal Employees for Democratic Society, FEDS, FEDS, uh, I think she worked at uh, Health and Human Services, yes. or HEW at the time. She contacted me and told me about this petition against the war in Vietnam. So I agreed that I would sign it, and uh, it ended up being the most intense day of my life. Uh, New York Times had a front page article on March 31st, their Sunday edition, 1968. So in the morning, the article comes out. The article continues to deep into the uh, first section of the, of the paper. And the very last paragraph has my name and says I'm the only officer in the State Department to sign the petition. Later that morning, we go to see Martin Luther King Jr. at National Cathedral because we lived about three blocks away. And I remember my wife holding up our daughters saying, if you've ever seen a saint in your life, you're looking at him now. And King was killed five days later. It was the last Sunday sermon of his life was at National Cathedral. Then we go home, and that evening, LBJ gives his speech in which at the end, to the shock of everybody, he says he's not going to run again. I suspect it was because Bobby Kennedy had entered the race, and, J and LBJ did not want to be defeated a second time by Kennedy because he'd been defeated in 1960. Mm -hmm. And within five minutes after LBJ finished his speech, my phone rings, I pick up the phone, and it's a death threat for me saying I'm one of those responsible for LBJ withdrawing because of my anti-war activities. In other words, somebody had read the New York Times, had read all the way through that section, found my name at the end of that article, and I was important enough so in five minutes after the speech, not half an hour or an hour afterwards, in five minutes they call me, and for the next week, uh, my secretaries at my office and my wife are getting these death threat phone calls. We, we had police protection for a week. I mean, nothing happens, but it terrified both of them. And, and Do you it was, have any idea who did it? No, we don't. No, we have no idea. Well, the signing of the petition got you uh, into even more trouble as time went on in the State Department, correct? Well, yeah, uh, it, uh, it did because I continued my activities and, uh, and they again called me in because they, they, they learned of the signing of the petition. And again, they, I argued that I have a right as constitutional rights under the First Amendment. <laughs> of course, they hated that. Um, and uh, then in 68, 69, I worked in Latin American affairs, public, affair, public, public relations. Uh, and uh, this is during the time of the uh, march on uh, Washington. 
uh, I mean, uh, the March on Poverty and the Resurrection City, and meanwhile, I've got very involved in that. 68. In 68, yes, in the summertime of 68, that I had already moved on to uh, uh, Latin American public affairs. And um, anyway, believe it or not, Reyes T. Arena, the leader of, uh, of uh, Chicanos in northern New Mexico, he was part of the march. Because, of course, the march was incredible. It was Appalachian whites. It was Native Americans, it was Chicanos, it was African Americans. I mean, it was like this all-encompassing thing that, that Martin Luther King had, is bringing together even after his death. Well, Rias Tiarina comes to the State Department because he wants to talk with Rusk because he's upset about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican War. And he said it had promises that people who owned farms and lands could continue to own them after the shift of the border. And the lands have been grabbed away, stolen away from the Chicanos of northern New Mexico over the, over the century. So he's at State Department to confront Rusk with this thing. Aren't you going to enforce the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? And I, in public affairs, was supposed to put out a press release answering, well, I knew nothing about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So I go into State Department library and pull it out. And I come to the conclusion that Tiarina is right. <laughs> so I go to a lawyer in State Department, and I'm talking with him. And this lawyer turns around and he says, whose side are you on, his or ours? So we made no press thing, but Tiarina comes to the main entrance of the State Department, and he has a leaflet, which I tried to find for you all, but I couldn't. And it said, come watch the greatest duel under the sun, Dean Rusk versus Reyes Tiarina, high noon at State Department main entrance. <laughs> so I just watch him. He gives a speech, and there's maybe 20 people there behind him and so on who come from New Mexico and so on. But anyway, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I was involved with. And believe it or not, in 68, 69, State Department picked me to start giving speeches around the United States explaining U.S. foreign policy and explaining U.S. foreign aid. So I gave about 100 speeches in three months. I went to Alabama, gave about 30, 40 speeches, went to uh, Florida, gave about 30, 40 speeches. I went to Cincinnati, I went to D.C., I went to State Department. I was the only, this is during the Vietnam War, I was the only speaker for state that did not get tomato stuff thrown at them while they were speaking. Did you ever talk about Vietnam in those speeches? Well, I did, but of course I gave State Department's policy. But, any, but even so, obvious somehow, uh, maybe it's because I was young and, and I was speaking often to college classes, to high school classes, in addition to Kiwanis clubs and stuff like that. But I, I never had any problem whatsoever. And I just think that I talked like I'm talking now, in a sense, in a conversational way rather than like a speechifying way. And, and, and State Department thought I was the best speaker they had for, for, a, young, for a young officer in, in the whole department. Then the head of Inter-American Affairs said, this guy's against the war. We can't have him out there speaking. So they canceled me to speak in the future. But uh, <laughs> So there's this constant stuff. And then the reason I went to Tabriz is because there was obviously dissent inside state, not just my own, but uh, other people, but not as open as, as I was. But it was, there were rumblings all through the young officers of State Department. So they set up, the Policy Planning Council of State set up a young division of it called Open Forum, and I was one of the leaders of this. And they asked me to give a, t uh, a round table about, uh, about Cuba. This is here in the U.S. Yeah, this is, this is here in the State Department. They do a round table. The round table for State Department. Yeah, 69. That's right. And so I invited people from the press, from students, from like I had Phil Wheaton, a, a religious uh, leader, um, uh, and people from state, from et cetera, et cetera, about Cuba. Well, I made the remark, because I was in charge of public affairs for Alliance for Progress, I made the remark, I said, well, according to the goals of the Alliance for Progress in health and education, the Latin American country that's supposed to come closest to those goals is Cuba. Anyway, the White House guys just freaked out. Nixon had come into office by this time, and they switched me from La Paz, Bolivia. I was supposed to go there as a political officer. We were already preparing to go a month uh, and to, to breeze Iran, and I heard through the grapevine that Nixon administration told the State Department this guy is never to go to Latin America again. So I was sent to Tabriz, Iran. We loved going back to Iran, but we knew that it was the end of my career. And I had no regrets. I mean, I felt that the war was a more important moral thing than my staying in State How Department. How long were you in Tabriz at second Two years. It was always two-year assignments, uh, two years in State, two at Tabriz. So you did really 10 years in the State Department, and for most of that time, you were actually actively against the war. Well, from 67 on, 67 to 71, so four years, yes. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, so I go to Tabriz. And uh, it's just a very small consul, just a consul and myself a vice consul and so on. And so I get to know all the Peace Corps volunteers. Well, because we were, quote, friends with the Shah, we had more Peace Corps volunteers in Iran than any other place on earth. So in our district in western Iran, we had maybe 138 Peace Corps volunteers. Well, I got all the stuff from the Quakers about draft counseling. So I became the draft counselor for all the Peace Corps volunteers. Now, state never to this day, I don't think, learned that I was doing that. 
But anyway, they would come in, and if they ever accounted me about it, I would say, listen, if people have tax problems, they go to the IRS, and the IRS tells them how to get deductions, right? I said, I'm doing the same thing with the draft. I feel that I can tell the law and the regulations to the Peace Corps volunteers about what is open to them, what is not open to them. I felt I was doing the same thing as IRS was doing with regard to taxes I was doing for the draft. But I got my information not from the draft board, but from the Quakers. And uh, anyway, for three, off three Peace Corps volunteers, I wrote letters to their draft boards about them being conscientious objectors, and all three got to CO status. And my belief is, is that I wrote it on letterhead uh, paper, three or four pages for each one, and I'm sure a draft board in the middle of Iowa getting this for a particular person was, was very impressive. And I, I felt it was the best thing I ever did in my life was to get the CO status for those three Peace Corps volunteers. And then one of Peace Corps volunteers suggested, hey, it's moratorium time. This is 1969. Uh, oh, a moratorium. I did not go to work that day. And that freaked out the embassy and my, my boss. I mean, just one day I did not go to work. But it was because of moratorium all across the US. People were refusing to do things. Then mobilization comes along. What was that, a month later? Yeah. And me and Peace Corps volunteer decided we would do a petition against the war in Vietnam to all US government employees in Iran and their dependents. Well, because of our relationship with the Shah, including military, we probably had 20,000 official Americans in Iran. So we drew up this petition. We distributed it to the military, to US information agency, to US AID, to uh, the US embassy, et cetera, et cetera. Military refused to distribute them and threatened us with $10,000 fine and 10 years in prison for leading the troops to mutiny. The CIA, uh, through the grapevine, I heard they wanted to be tried for treason and hung. The embassy, uh, the ambassador of charged affairs, refused to allow the other embassy officers to get the petition, which upset the officers. They said, we may not agree with Mr. Smith regarding the petition, but we feel we should be allowed to receive the petition. So it became a huge thing. I mean, every cocktail party, everything in Tehran, that's all they're talking about is this petition. Did very many people sign it? Almost all the Peace Corps volunteers did. I signed it and one USIA officer signed it, and that was it. Then we sent it to Nixon, and the White House sends back a little letter we sent on your petitions to State Department, and obviously State Department got them. And I've never seen the files as to how State Department reacted to receiving the petitions. Um, but obviously, that, that, that petition effort was what guaranteed I was going to be kicked out of state. And that was about 1971 60, when you 60, left State Department? Yeah, 71 I left state, yeah. And, and you told me before that the pool, the counter, as, well, as much as all the political stuff, the pool, the counterculture for you was very strong. Yeah, well, I was, I was becoming a hippie in Tabriz, basically. I was growing my hair long and so on like that, growing uh, sideburns and stuff like that. And I already saw myself as totally a part of the counterculture, even though I was, I was in Tabriz. Do you remember what it was like in the early 70s when those, uh, those first three, 70 to 73 or so? Were well, I come back uh, in June 71, so it was uh, a month after the uh, May Day protests. Of course, I heard a lot about them and so on. But I immediately, and I, officially I wasn't out of state till November 30th of 71. Well, I arrived back in June, and state does not want me in the building. So from June until November, they gave me no work to do whatsoever. You had full pay. Yeah, full and pay. What did, when, what did you do being a fully paid State Department guy? What did you do for that six months? Well, let's see. I worked in community bookstore, which is on P Street Northwest, which is this anarchist bookstore, which had stuff from everywhere. It was a fabulous bookstore. I was a volunteer there. I worked with the American Civil Liberties Union in developing rights for federal employees. Um, I, I, I actually applied for Vince Ramos Brigade while I was still in State Department. I was accepted for Vince Ramos Brigade. But somebody else on my brigade heard I was a State Department officer and freaked out, just assuming I'm a spy. So they asked the Cuban government about this, and the Cuban government says, listen, we assume every French Ramos brigade has a spy, but it's not going to be somebody who's openly in the State Department. So the Cuban, they eventually dropped me off from the brigade because they didn't want to create turmoil within the brigade because of my presence. But the Cuban government said I could go any time I wanted to Cuba. They'd be glad to see me. I've never been. Uh, it's a real regret of my life, probably the, the top of the bucket list that uh, I would love to, to do sometime. Um, anyway, so then I'm kicked out of state, and within less than a month, I leave the family, which is, in many ways, the worst thing of my life. But I, and my, and I, I love my wife at the time. I still love her today. She still loves me today, et cetera, et cetera. She lives in Hawaii. But, um, and, uh, but anyway, in other words, I changed my whole life within a month uh, in terms of actual, uh, you know, real ties with both family and with the government. And so I, jo I, jo I entered the House of uh, Federal Employees for Peace in 1854 Wyoming Avenue and lived there for the whole year of 72. And this is Madeline Gold and Sharon Rose and, and, uh, and others. And uh, we were trying to organize the entire uh, workforce of the federal government against the war in Vietnam.
we had one fabulous success. One time we went out to Rockville with the National Institute of Mental Health with um, uh, Natasha Reddig, who I was close to. We, we were lovers for a while. And I think we had over a thousand people on the lawn outside of NIMH against the war in Vietnam. We had speakers. I think I.F. Stone may have spoken. And anyway, it was quite a day. It was the biggest day we had as Federal Employees for Peace. This was a direct descendant of Federal Employees for Democratic Society, was Federal Employees for Peace. Well, so it's quite a thing to come back to. Um, yeah. And that same year, 72, I get arrested twice, once in front of the White House uh, for probably standing where I wasn't supposed to stand on the sidewalk. And uh, then later that year, we went to the eight or ten of us went to the visitors gallery of the House of Representatives and we're screaming things like your votes destroy nations, your votes, your votes kill children and uh, and we got slammed to the floor by the guards at the uh, House of Representatives and I'm arrested by my former boss who I'd worked under as a capital cop in 1960. He gave me a long look wondering, he knew he knew me from somewhere but of course I'm a straight guy in 1960, I'm a total hippie in 1973. He couldn't remember where he'd known me from before. <laughs> So uh, they let us go after after they got us out of the visitors' gallery and so on. Well, now I want to get on to the other thing that you love doing for so many years is that your work with WGTV. Yeah, right, so right. Tell us your WGTV. Well, after '72, uh, I in early '73, I went to Hawaii for four months, worked with tourists uh, there. I didn't do any political work in Hawaii, but I got to really know the uh, state, and I came to the conclusion at the end of it, it should be an independent country. And of course, it had been 80 years before before we overthrew their government. But anyway, then I, I hitchhiked back from Los Angeles to here, and then uh, I, I, I re-entered 1854 Wyoming for a month or so while I was getting a, a permanent place. And then I moved in the Embassy of Atlantis, which is on Embassy Row, so of course we're the Embassy of Atlantis with their own flag outside. What was the Embassy of Atlantis? Huh? What was the Embassy of Atlantis? I think originally it was a flower power house. When I got there, it was just sort of a mix of people. I mean, all of us, sort of counterculture and radicals, but it wasn't a political house. It wasn't even a flower power house anymore, but we had the remnants of it. We had uh, stuff all over, like uh, bags hanging from strings. I mean, boxes like from Lord and Taylor, empty boxes, you know, wrapped up, hanging from strings in the bathroom. And outside, we had our own flag, and of course, you know, because it was Embassy Row. And uh, But anyway, then that uh, summer and fall, uh, I got invited by a friend of mine, Rich Pollack, to, uh, he, he was in the Marxist-Leninist study group, which I'd entered that fall, and I was walking with him one time, and he uh, said, uh, do you want to come on to, to WGTB, which is our favorite radio station? I said, sure. So within a week, I'm broadcasting news, and I'm on the news collective of WGTB Radio, which is Georgetown University Radio. About the programs that, that, that well, uh, friends of mine, women friends of mine, organized Sophie's Parlor, which uh, was the first women's program in D.C. radio history. Uh, we had the first gay uh, radio program in D.C. radio history called Friends. In fact, WPFW, the uh, Pacifica station, didn't get a, 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 a LGBT program until about 15 years ago. In other words, they went decades without one. Um, so I felt very proud of GTB, and the U.S. government so hated our station that Spiro Agnew, Vice President under Nixon, actually gave speeches against WGTB, saying we're just an outlet for third world propaganda. Of course, our main thing was it was against the war in Vietnam and civil rights and the women's movement and the gay movement, et cetera. We were, it was like we brought it all together, and it was the best years of my life. And uh, the Jesuit brothers did not like us smoking dope around the equipment, so because uh, they said it would mess up the equipment. Uh, this is at Georgetown this University. This is Georgetown University. So in their wisdom, the Jesuit brothers gave us an entire separate room just to smoke dope in. So I thought that was very nice of them, too. And when did, that, when did, uh, when did the university finally decide to shut you down? Well, it, it was weird. We would get complaints from the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, about our programming. It was always the DJs that would tick them off with something obscene in the middle of the night. Never about the News Collective, but Georgetown would try to crush the News Collective because I'm sure their alumni and the U.S. government was hating what we were doing. Um, so uh, then uh, in 75, they came in with every security guard on campus um, and uh, shut down uh, the entire station with, I mean, I guess they thought we were going to be holed up with submachine guns or something. But anyway, they, they fired all of us in 75. And the next day, a thousand people demonstrated against the shutting down of the station. They weren't Georgetown University students. They were just because we were so popular, we had the best rock and roll in the whole D.C. area. WHFS was the only competition, and of course they had to have commercials. We ran 24-7 with no commercials, so, and we could choose whatever rock and roll. It wasn't top 20, it wasn't top 40, and we, we just had fabulous rock and roll. So between the news collective, the news, and, and, the, and a lot of journalists, regular journalists, they listened to us because we got alternate news. We had Zodiac News Service, I think it was Underground News Service. There are three or four news services that sent us packets of, of info from all over the U.S. and all over the world uh, into, like, 
when the uh, American Indian Movement seized the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1972, we had a correspondent inside with AIM as the only correspondent of any of any news thing media in the United States was inside there the whole time that they occupied the Bureau of Indian Affairs. That was Abalone. It was John John Walsh. Yeah, yeah. And actually, when he died in the 1990s, he was still close all those years to AIM. And Dennis Banks gave him a memorial service when Abalone died in 1990s and so on. And then when they had Wounded Knee out in 73, uh, we had live broadcasts on WGTB about Wounded Knee. I mean, it, it was just an amazing station. When uh, the uh, 91173, when the Chilean government was overthrown with Allende, we had somebody who was an early hacker who somehow hacked NBC and all the major stations in their stuff sending on wires from Chile to the United States about the torture, about the stadium, all this stuff that the Washington Post did not report on for years. We had it within 24 hours. We were reporting it because we were hacking into the the feeds from uh, from uh, American correspondents from uh, from Santiago. But I mean, this is the kind of station it was. It was uh, uh, eventually the station ended its news around 70. The station is still on the air, but it's only on the internet now. It's it's been there for over 50 years. I went to the 50th reunion. Um, but anyway, they finally shut it down. But it became the the station for punk music in D.C. And that's the reason that in the rock and roll world that punk music from DC became one of the punk centers of America was here in DC was because of WGTB playing their music and having benefit concerts with punk bands from locally and so on so in the late 70s. Well, well um, what else did you want to talk about of the, of the many things you've done? Do you want to talk about the study groups, uh, getting into the study group? Uh, I think it's important because there were 70 of us uh, probably that entered the Marxist-Lenin study groups, and well, I entered. Give us a little background on what they were first. Okay, uh, well, in the in mid 1973, these study groups, Marxist-Lenin study groups, were organized, and it took me a while to figure out sort of what had happened. It's basically organized by people who were disillusioned, who were from the Communist Party USA, who become disillusioned with what the Soviet Union had become and with what the CPUSA had become, and they wanted to go back to the roots of Marx's teachings, of Lenin's teachings, of Engels' teachings, et cetera, et cetera. And they believe that China was actually, at least the, 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 the word that was put out from China went back to those original uh, origins of communism in the purest sense of the word. And so they organized these study groups. And I went, not because I was a communist, I'd always hated communism because I hated dictatorship. I was pro-democratic, so I hated Nazism, I hated communism all my life. but I. I went because I figured, well, listen, two-thirds of the world is now supposedly communist. It's obviously, it's not just a matter of power and dictatorship and, and killing and so on. There must be something more to it. So I thought, at least I should try to understand what it's about. So I went into the study groups, and basically it was the most challenging and wonderful intellectual exercise of my life, was to go through... So after about three years. Yeah, well, uh, the study groups were two years uh, from 73 to 75. Uh, it was like two school years, 73, 74, and 74, 75. And we probably read about 50 books by uh, Engels, Marx, Stalin, Lenin, Mao, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, anyway, I ended up uh, in 75, 76 uh, joining the, uh, Marxist, uh, the uh, Communist Party marxist leninist which was sort of the Maoist party of the United States. There are a number of other Maoist parties, but our party had actual direct contact with the Communist Party of China and, and interactions with them and so on. And I was very active in U.S.-China People's Friendship Association as well, which was to sponsor friendship. And you know, we, we would organize trips for people to go to China. Like Lucy Murphy was one of the people that we sent to China at that time 40 years ago. And uh, a number of other people in the D.C. area, people from RAP, we sent to China uh, to visit China. RAP Incorporated the, the, uh, 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 up on uh, uh, Willard Place. Um, so. Um, to me, it's, it's important whether one agrees with uh, Maoism or not, but I became a communist because to me, at least, the, the ideals of it was to expand democracy to the economic sphere of the world. Like in the United States, we have a, lot of, a fair amount of social democracy and political democracy, but in the economic world, they say, well, you can work any place you want, but yes, it's like, well, which dictatorship do you want to work for? Because every corporation is a dictatorship. And I feel that it should be employee-owned businesses. And to me, that is communism. And communism is coming to the U.S. even though we don't know it. In 1970, 4% of businesses in America were employee-owned. Now it's over 20% are employee-owned. And, and to me, that is communism in its ultimate sense. Now, Soviet Union or China has never tried to implement communism. They are only socialist. In other words, owning the, I mean, you know, the factories and so on. But communism, the ideal goes that the state fades away and you have the people controlling where they work 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, employee-owned businesses, that is communism. Um, um, federal credit unions, that's communism because it's owned by the uh, people who contribute. Co-ops are communism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like a revolution taking place in America. Nobody talks about it. <laughs> and of course, nobody says that it's communism because, of course, communism has this thing of being Stalinist fascism you know, or Chinese dictatorship and so on. In fact, I would argue that communism or the Communist Party took Russia from being feudal to being semi-capitalist today and an oligarchy today. And it took China from a feudal state to a capitalist state. It has not taken them to communism. Only Marshal Tito in Yugoslavia seriously tried to shift to communism. And again, this is not talked about. But he gave the factories in Yugoslavia over to the workers, and, and sincerely over to the workers. And any time they had problems, he, he pushed for further democracy inside the factories and so on. But I, I don't know what happened to that, whether it was the ethnic split in Yugoslavia broke up the factory system or whether it was from coming from a peasant background, they couldn't understand the modern industrial world inside the factories. But anyway, at least Tito made an effort. But that's the only socialist state that I feel made a, a, even a semi-effort to become communist. Um, all that you've done many things in those <laughs> The years that we're talking about, 60 Right, right, right. I mean, I mean, I can go into 30 or 40, 50 other things that I, I did in those years. I all these times. So I'm going yeah. to ask you the sort of closing question we ask everyone. How did these activities, that you did these radical activities during those years, how, how did that shape the rest of your life? Right, right, and right. And tell us also about your daughter and granddaughter. Yeah, okay. Uh, what happened is 1980, I had to give up my 24-7 activist life, and I did it for a whole decade. The whole decade of the 70s, I was 24-7 uh, active. I, I, I helped organize a men's group to support the, the first men's group in D.C. radio history, I mean, D.C. history, to support the women's movement in 1972. Uh, I, was, I ran radical therapy groups, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I worked with the American Indian Movement. Uh, I took friends of mine from AIM up to prisons in uh, Pennsylvania to give ceremony on weekends with the Native American prisoners up there. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it just goes on. And to me, that was one wonderful thing, and I think it's happening again. It wasn't a matter like, well, I was in the women's movement, or I was in the civil rights movement, or I was in the anti-war. We saw all of this as being one movement for democracy. In fact, I would argue that in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, it was the greatest increase in democracy in American history. Now, it didn't go through the pain of the Civil War and so on, but we're talking women. We're talking African Americans, we're talking Asian Americans, Native Americans, handicapped students, college students, children. We're talking 60 to 80 percent of the population gained major rights in those decades of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it was all from us within ourselves. It had nothing to do with the government. We forced the government to pass the Civil Rights Acts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and to me, uh, we should be incredibly proud of that. And you know, we uh, activists or leftists, since we didn't get our paradise on earth, we're sort of, we don't really understand what we accomplish. The far right does. And of course, beginning with the Reagan administration, they've been trying to roll all that back. And not only that, roll back the New Deal, roll back the progressive era, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they have never forgiven us for what we did in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But I think we should, and to me, we were all Americans. We were the Americans pushing for everybody's created equal. We were the ones pushing for ultimate democracy and so on like that. That's why I wear this hat, because I'm so proud to be with these ideals of America and so on, and to this day. And, uh, and uh, anyway, I feel I'm a Democrat with a small d, I'm a communist with a small c, I'm a Christian with a small c. Because if you look back at Christ and I have the needle and so on, that's against the rich. He's saying the rich are not where you should be. It's the, it's the working people and, and, and the poor people of the world that are the majority and should get equal rights to everybody else. Even the State Department, I tried to organize a chapter of Federal Employees and Democratic Society. And I had 400 people in the auditorium where JFK used to give his press conferences. And I'm alone up on stage and I really don't know what to do because I thought I'd get other people to come along with me. But I argued then, I said, the people who are looked down upon most in society should be paid the most in their salaries. In other words, the janitors and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of African-American women who went nuts when I was saying this. And I was saying people who enjoy their jobs should perhaps be paid less. I said, I really enjoy being a diplomat. I said, I think I should be paid enough for my basic necessities, but I think all of us should be. But I think jobs that are looked down upon, like garbage people and so on, should be paid more. Like a differential. <laughs> anyway, state didn't like this either. <laughs> well, so part of your, part of your um, life also was with your, you had two daughters. And you right, said right. Yeah, one of your daughters and one of your granddaughters are very act, big activists now. Tell us about them. Yeah, well, of course, my daughters were raised in this atmosphere of myself and my, and my wife. My wife is incredibly active in Hawaii, working in Palestinian affairs to this day. And she's actually tied with the sovereignty movement for independence for Hawaii out there. 
and she's very close to Anne Wright, who is this uh, very activist woman who has uh, worked with um, um, uh, over there in Crawford, Texas, you know, in uh, Camp Casey. Uh, uh, she and Cindy Sheehan. Cindy Sheehan. They work together as, a, as partners. Very and 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 anyway. Uh, and my my youngest my oldest daughter is a lesbian, and she's been very active in women and LGBT things for decades. And uh, she's a legal secretary here in D.C. My youngest daughter is on the steering committee of Jewish Force for Peace, but she lived in Jerusalem for two years during the first intifada. And as a result of that, my granddaughter is half Palestinian. And the Israeli government hated what my daughter was doing over there because her job was to give guided tours to people understand the Israeli-Palestinian situation, even though she gave a very fair representation of the Israeli side and a fair presentation of the Palestinian side. Most Americans who went over there had never heard the Palestinian side in their lives. So the Israeli, but it was World Council of Churches. The Israeli government wants to get along well with the Protestants of America, so they can't shut it down. <laughs> so I went to visit her there in 89. But my, my granddaughter went to University of Maryland, and there she was president of Students for Justice in Palestine. And now she's on a, on a major a Palestinian group here in the United States. She's 23 years old now but she studied animal behavior studies, and so animals in Palestine will be her whole life, I know. And, uh, but she's also, just like we were in the 60s, she reaches out all kinds of things. She organized a march for Trayvon Martin three or four years ago from D.C. down to the White House and so on, and she's a leader. She, I was always a foot soldier for democracy. I never led much, even though I was co-chairman of a Feds committee back then uh, to abolish to, 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 uh, the anti-ballistic missile system. Um, working with Madeline Gold and the others and so on. But, uh, but my granddaughter, uh, I have no doubt, will spend the rest of her life principally around, uh, around, around Palestine, yeah. And to me, I've never been so nuts about a human being in my life as I am about my granddaughter. And a lot of it is, is you know, it's like I'm involved in all this stuff. And my, my daughter and my two daughters are great, but in a sense, they're sort of one issue things, even though they believe all the other things. But my granddaughter, like us, she gets into everything. And so to me, it's like passing on that legacy from my mother to me, to my daughters, to my granddaughter. And I mentioned one time when my granddaughter graduated from college, I said, well, you know, and I have no doubt that my granddaughter's children will be of the same kind of thing. And my granddaughter said, they better be. <laughs> Isn't that great? When your, kids, when your kids do what yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Cliff. Thank you very much. Well, I, I, uh, I hope that, uh, oh, one last thing. Yes. To me, this is sort of almost a cosmic thing. I've said this a few times, and I get no response, and I think it's because it's too big a thing, but I said 95 to 98 percent of all killings, woundings, crimes, wars, genocide, and torture are done by men. And I think we men should rethink how we live our lives. And I don't know whether it's genetics or social pressure or a combination of both, but to the extent that women get more power in the world, I think we're going to be a better world. My mother believed that women are superior to men, so when the women's movement came along, I had no real problem with it. And anyway, that's the thing I'd, I'd last like to leave with, that maybe men, we can start rethinking how we live our lives. And of course, even killers, 99% of their lives, they're not killing people. <laughs> so it's obvious we can do it. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anne. It's been a pleasure. Do you think it went okay? It and I had one other segment I wanted yeah, to we'll, say. We'll okay. Do it all, okay. Okay. All right, I'm rolling. Do it. Okay. What else? Okay. Well, I, I, I feel it's important if we're talking about the 60s and 70s that we really should honestly talk about drugs, and not in the sense of the the quote evil that it brings or the bad things and so on, the reefer madness and so on. Uh, I had grass once when I was in college, and all I did was laugh for about 12 hours. My friend thought it was a fraud because he, he wasn't laughing. And, uh, but then I didn't have it again until I went to Tabriz, Iran, in which a Peace Corps volunteer introduced me to Afghan hash, which one could buy for 10 cents an ounce, not $10, 10 cents an, an ounce. And the Peace Corps volunteers, many of them would buy a kilo or two of hash when they got to Iran. They were excellent Peace Corps volunteers, but they used that hash all for their relaxation the whole time they were in Iran. Um, for me, the importance of, of uh, grass and hash was that before I took it, I categorized everything. I was a very straight American. My family's been here since the 1600s. I'm superbly Anglo, and my view, my mother's family's from Texas, Texas 1819. My father's family is in Maine from before 1740. But anyway, um, so I categorized everything, and I saw the world in a sense in Anglo terms. And like, here's politics, here was uh, economics, here was, uh, here was family, et cetera, et cetera. Well, grass screwed up my head and 
tangled everything together, but it also made me realize that everything in the world is interconnected, and one cannot understand anything really unless you understand the connections between these supposedly separate spheres of our lives. And so I never got addicted. I took a fair amount of cocaine, a fair amount of hash, a fair amount of LSD, a fair amount of you know, meth, et cetera, even, even the quaaludes and PCP. But none of them, I had a wonderful time, 17 years, and I never had a bad trip. I never OD'd. Uh, I had a wonderful, wonderful time. And uh, I quit in 86 because it just wasn't doing much for me anymore. I guess my body had gotten used to it and was not going to give me any more highs. So I stopped and I've only had maybe, you know, mushrooms two or three times since then and maybe grass three or four times since then. And the last time was probably about eight years ago or so. And to me, mushrooms are the dream drug. It is, there's no after effects. You have to plan eight hours. I, I would sit on a mesa in New Mexico for eight hours and just drift off on the mushrooms. It was wonderful. But I do feel that we ought to talk about the relationship of drugs to that whole time of the 60s and 70s and so on. Actually, I just thought of another thing I want to ask you was in our previous conversation uh, a couple of days ago, um, you said that you came to a conclusion at some point that Washington, D.C. was a divine place oh, yes, organized. Yes. Tell me about that and why you thought okay, that. Okay, I'm, I'm really happy. I, I'm really into history. And I've read the history of the whole world. I studied it in college and so on. I thought I got a history degree and so on. And I've, I've often wondered, yes, I would have liked to have lived in ancient Greece. I would have liked to have lived in the Enlightenment in, in France in the 18th century or in Britain in the 19th century, et cetera, et cetera. But of all times that I would have wanted to have lived in history, the time I've lived in this city, I think, is the most wonderful time I could have chosen. Because this is Washington, D.C. This, in many ways, is the center of the earth. And to have lived through this counterculture thing and the civil rights movement, anti-Vietnam War movement, and to have been here and to have been active in it and so on, which I feel were actually not only pulling the U.S. forward, but pulling the world forward. Because when stuff gets on the media out of Washington or out of the U.S., including movies and so on like that, if something happens in Chile or in Chad, it doesn't get international recognition. But I feel the women's movement here is affecting every woman on earth. In fact, I would argue the women's movement has begun the greatest social movement in the history of the world. It's not just a matter of equal rights for women here in the United States. It's a matter of rights of women the whole three and a half billion or four billion women on earth and they are seeing these movies they see this media anyway i feel that if we can do stuff in dc i mean there are five of us in a men's group we picketed the rolling stones concert in 1972 july 4th um, just five of us were saying we were feeling that a lot of rock and roll is very sexist you have songs like under my thumb or brown sugar and so on and other rock and roll groups and so on and so but we put out this this uh, this pamphlet called cock rock Anyway, it gets into the Saturday Review of Literature, an article by Terry Southern. He reprints the entire leaflet, and it gets into the Manchester Guardian. It, they, they take the article in the Saturday Review of Literature. So it's like, here's five guys that print a leaflet, and probably 100,000 people read it in the Saturday Review of Literature, another 100,000 in England, and so on. So if you can have an impact in the U.S., or especially in this city, like one time when Nixon was going to, chi going to China, helicopters on the White House lawn, there were about 50 or 60 of us, hippies, yippies, this is 72, on the ellipse. Of course, it was a huge thing. Maybe the most important thing Nixon did was to go to China. But he called it a mission for peace. And we're talking about his hypocrisy. He's running the biggest war in the world, and he's going on a mission for peace? I mean, give us a break. So while we're there, we're not causing any real trouble, but we're there. Park police come up on their horses. A friend of mine pulls out his little red book, and he pushes it in the horse's face and says, overthrow your master. <laughs> Then a few minutes later, a CBS guy comes up. And this is running live TV on all networks, live nationwide. CBS comes up to, to the same guy and says, well, what do you hope to accomplish with this demonstration? And my friend pulls himself up very seriously and he says, well, actually, this is the beginning of our violent overthrow of the government. And the CBS guy just goes, for sure, what? <laughs> this is running on live TV nationwide. <laughs> We had a lot of fun. Of course, that's another thing was the humor. A.B. Hoffman caught into this. And of course, uh, you know, Rennie Davis and, and so on and so on. They, they got in. And of course, if you make fun of things, it brings down people probably faster than if you're serious about things and so on. It was great. Like Wavy Gravy and, and nobody for president. Wavy Gravy running for president. He says, well, everybody says nobody can do the job. He said, here I am. <laughs> nobody for president. <laughs> Thanks, Cliff. Thanks okay, great. well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, I'd been working in Hawaii, and uh, this is when I, I left Hawaii uh, in spring of uh, 73, and I was hitchhiking from Los Angeles to here. I'd done a lot of hitchhiking in my life, but uh, this is the only time I did a cross-country, and I always wanted to. 
and every third ride got me high. I carried no drugs with me, but uh, it was it was fabulous because it was the it was the end of the peak of the hippie era and the counterculture era, and uh, I took three months. And uh, the heart of the trip is visiting a friend of mine who was in prison in Cincinnati, Ohio, for one year for uh, five ounces of grass, and uh, he and I are still close friends. But anyway, I had to. I, I was told I got 15 minutes in Cincinnati at the prison, and uh, so I had to revolve that entire three months of hitchhiking around that 15 minutes in Cincinnati to visit him. Do you know the date the picture was taken, where that was taken? This was in North Carolina, and uh, within uh, 10 minutes after the picture was taken, uh, a young African-American guy in a Mustang picked me up, and before I'm even in the car, he's handing me a joint. Oh, I see, I see. That's okay. And, uh, and so... Uh, we go about 50 miles and we're getting nicely high and so on. He wants to drop me off and I said, that you're not going any further? He says, no, I just go up and down the highway getting people fucked up. <laughs> I thought, well, that's a public service, you know. Did you work with AAA? <laughs> okay, tell me about this picture. Okay, my uh, granddaughter went to the University of Maryland and got her degree there and to pay for her expenses, she worked here in, at fancy restaurants in D.C. and actually she ended up with no student debt from the University of Maryland as a result. Well, she worked at the Lincoln Restaurant on Vermont Avenue I think it's between L and uh, M. And one day, uh, she is serving a uh, president. In fact, later in the day, Obama announced the Dreamers program of delaying the DACA, I think it is, in which uh, uh, students and I guess their families could stay in the U.S. for two, two, four years while they got their education. But it was a big day for Obama, and this is what, where he was eating earlier in the day and being served by my granddaughter. And she had to go through security clearance, so I don't know how she made it, because she's one, she's half Palestinian, secondly, and, 2003, she's leading uh, 25,000 people in the White House against the war in Iraq, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but she passed security, so maybe the Israeli government doesn't have as much control over Obama's security practices as we think. <laughs> <laughs> this is the back side of that photo. Okay. All right, tell me about this photo. Okay, after I got into, after I returned from uh, Iran and I got into organizing, I did some construction work, but I got into cab driving because cab driving, uh, I didn't, I had no interest in a professional job because I wanted to be active against the war, active in civil rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or totally in the counterculture, uh, sex, drugs, and revolution. But anyway, I entered cab driving because it offered me total flexibility. I could stop and start whenever I wanted. I could go to demonstrations. I could go to meetings, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, for basically uh, 35 to 40 years, I drove a cab, but uh, it was it was great. Uh, uh, the boss was miles away. Uh, I had an egalitarian relationship with my passengers, uh, and of course, people here go from all over the world. They come from all over the world, and I knew enough about the world so that actually I could talk to them about just about anything. And uh, it was I really loved the job, and I did it until uh, early 2014. Perfect. You can put this interview into the archive. Oh, okay. Uh, you're supposed to sign sign both of these, and we get to keep a copy. And we keep a copy. The places you, you'll see the several places you need to sign. With the uh, you and the flag there, what is that? Okay, uh, this is in the American Consulate in Tabriz, the very last post I had. Um, I had the American flag. I also had a poster uh, with Abraham Lincoln with a quote, basically talking about the, the rights that we have as Americans and so on, and. Uh, but this, you could see that I was uh, quickly becoming a hippie while I was still in the State Department. And uh, in fact, uh, we were on the hippie route to Breeze was, which at that time was you had hippies from America and from Western Europe would get in VW minibuses and go through Europe, go through East, go through Turkey, come to Tabriz, then go to Tehran, then go like on to India and to Pakistan and Nepal and so on. So we were on the route, so we had all these people coming into the consulate and so on. And uh, I would talk with them. and have some great conversations with regard to uh, drugs and uh, and uh, spiritualism, like that they would get in Nepal and Afghanistan, and uh, anyway, it was, it was really fascinating. Do you know the year that was taken? Or oh, was undoubtedly it was uh, 70 or 71, okay. probably 71. Okay. Oh, good. Tell me about the other image. What is that? Um, this is my wife and I about three or four years earlier. We were in Athens. I guess it was 67 or 66 or so on. We were as tourists there. And actually, I don't know who took the picture. I guess one of these roving photographers kind of things. But mm -hmm. anyway, you can see that I was basically a very straight man at that point in terms of my appearance and my clothes and so on like that. Um, so there, it seemed to change awfully fast in the mid-60s. 
Yeah, yeah, really, literally, 65, that's what most people still look yeah. like, including people who moved by right, 67. Right. Everybody right. looks really well, different. The, be- the Beatles changed, too. So uh-huh, that's, that's right. Well, the Beatles were our leaders in other ways. Fact, it took me decades to understand the phrase, clean with Gene. Yeah. And what it really meant is, is that all the hippies that joined uh, G- Eugene McCarthy's campaign, they uh-huh. cut off their beards, yeah. their long hair, and so on, to look like this. Look, look like that, yeah. Yeah, right. right. He wanted them to look like and, that. And uh, yeah. I didn't realize that until recently. <laughs> Um, th- this represents different parts of my life. I'm from Alaska, so I have a little button with the flag of Alaska. Uh, I was in the anti-war Vietnam War movement, so I have the peace dove of the war movement. I was really into uh, grass and other illegal drugs, so I have the marijuana leaf. This represents 10 years of service in the State Department. Then I have uh, various um, uh, Palestinian uh, things, and then of course one for marijuana over here. Cuban flag, I got this very actually at Free the Cuban Five uh, meeting and so on just a few years ago. And then I have a Mao button because I was a Maoist. Uh, and this is the one year anniversary of my party, the Communist Party Marxist-Leninist, which is a Maoist party. And then these others are Palestinian buttons and so on. But uh, especially these buttons sort of revolve around my, my, a lot of my life. Okay. Very good.